Uh, now let's go to the trading data. Tina's. Um, you already saw that. And remember, this is from uh, olden times, 1986. And let's get rid of these axes. Let's do a so let's um, switch on the labels. Let's do a select. Now we have the names of all the um, you know the labels of all because I selected all points by making a very big selection. Then we got all these um, country names put in there, and the, and the, the um, we have um, the we look at the label. We have the number of the point and the cluster which is in, and uh, we have the blue ones which are the other cluster without any special name, and we have the Commonwealth, the uh, Communist, and the South American clusters. So that's that. You know, we could take the um, unnamed set, the rest, and we could um, change them from spheres to some other shape. We can make them all triangles, you see, so that makes them really stand out even better for making triangles. Uh, that's your choice. And again, I'm just using the uh, left mouse, the orderly mouse button. And I'm just uh, using my trackball to move things around. So that's that. Trading data. Now we come to the solvent data. Let's make it big. Oh my, by mistake. I made it too small. Let's make it bigger. Okay, so this has glyphs already defined on it. And um, <coughs> some of them, the labels are actually named labels, like uh, hydrophilic or double bond, which I'm not quite certain. If we go to the, this uh, level 11, we have quite a few of those. They're spheres. Um, and they're sort of the greenish color. Uh, we can. Um, Change that color if we like it to a light blue. So and then we can go back to a greenish, uh, different color here. Well, we can even make them a more avoid making this furry color here. So that's what all those are. That we should be uh, numerous. So. Use the hydrophilic to see which they are. You just unselect them. So those are those three nice uh, spheres here. The double bond of those two there, which are actually very near the uh, hydrophilic. That's what sort of this plot tells you. It says these points are pretty near each other, although they're. And then the perfluoro uh, way over here, they're all together. But uh, they're way away from these other ones. All right, so that's uh, and this uh, particular um, mapping was done by the deterministic and meaning uh, version of uh, generated topographic mapping. Deterministic and meaning get you more reliable answers. And now we finally want to do some two, the last two examples, which are the, um, come back to the slides. They are, we'll do the, um, well, this will be a bigger case for 146K points. So probably our poor old computer will get unhappy. Get rid of that while it's uh, doing this thing here. 
I most certainly have to I get it that right. So let's get it really started properly. I didn't click hard enough. Sometimes that happens in Windows. You don't click hard enough, and you're, sometimes you're not certain whether it was slow because it was starting up or slow because you didn't actually properly do it. So you can see, Plotvis is diligently reading the data. It's not ready to do anything very intelligent yet. That's a typical Windows program. We'll have to wait. Uh, here we are. It's coming up. So here we have 446. Uh, Sequences, they're mapped into three dimensions, they're colored in a way that we don't want to discuss here. And here we are. So as these are actually have no glyphs, even though there are 446 of them, you can actually manipulate them quite well. You can see it's quite responsive. It's glyphs that make it unresponsive. And so you can really see the structure here. There's a lot of a lot of very interesting structure here, which correspond presumably to some some families. So this is uh, fungi data. And so these presumably are fungi families. So we can just rotate it to make it clearer. And the, the coloring here is the coloring of clusters that we found by separate clustering program. And um, you can see the, this tells you immediately the quality of the clusters, namely, if we look over here. Let's actually look at that. So we can go over here, press C. Then we moved it, so we're at that clustering point. Let's get rid of these measurable axes. And so we've now seen this small cluster here. We can make it bigger. So this is actually sort of a cluster, but it's not very, so it's not terribly impressive. You can see these clusters are where, so if I go to over here. These clusters are pretty clear clusters, but um, this purple and this yellow one, but they have these tails. The tails tend to correspond to mismeasurements, the length dependence of the distance of determination. And uh, then you can you can sort of study here. You can look at the uh, this white thing over here. Let me because there are about 100 clusters here, the, the, the coloring is not unique. So you don't actually know directly what the, what, the, uh, what the white ones are. We can probably use this um, labeling. So actually we need to, we didn't set the labeling one, let's set the labeling one. Now label is finally true. And here we get a typical point here. We can see what all these things are. They're in cluster 110. So you'd have to look here at cluster 110. Here we are. So it's this um, 110 here. There are 14,000 points in this cluster. So we can get rid of those points. I have to confirm that. Let's get rid of these labels. And now, so you can see that um, this particular clustering program did not split this up. And in fact, if you, I looked at that particular results, and uh, and it was, it's not so obvious. This isn't a, some difference between the way the points look in the original space and the way they look in three dimensions. When well, you can map into three dimensions and not and. Look, find structure which is typically there in the higher dimensions, but maybe not always, and vice versa. So this is not totally reliable. If it was, then you don't always, if you map the three dimensions, you obviously are throwing information away. Anyway, you can suddenly see here that it looks as though there are at least two or maybe more clusters of points within this cluster. So that's, that's the type of thing you can tell from this type of plot. Here's some nice clusters, which are obviously very clean. And uh, those are actually pretty globular clusters. We can now go back to our original um, reset. So that's what it used to be. So we reset ourselves. We've got our axes back. We can get rid of those again.
And now, now we can change the size of the upper Here's this, here's this white cluster 110 that we were looking at before. Let's double check that. My, look, this doesn't disappear on us. Okay. So there we are on that particular 446. So that was a large data set. It was reasonably responsive, although as you saw, I had some trouble myself with the program having waiting, and I'm not quite certain what's going on. So that's, that's probably, a, that's just life, or an area where we need to improve the program. Um, so we can get rid of that. And then the final example we had here was 100K from a metagenomic sample. This time my click was correct. And here we go up to a big plot. <coughs> and uh, we can get rid of the axis again, because this one doesn't seem to benefit from, from an axis. We can make it clearly a little bigger. This is a very globular one. Well, this is not fully clustered. This is so-called divided in what we call mega regions, which are groups that we can then, which are a bit ma more manageable in size. Uh, technically, what we do, we take uh, the I think there's over 600K um, points in the original sample. We take a random set of 100K, cluster them very accurately, and we sorry, use um, <coughs> multi-dimensional scaling on them and clustering to break them up into clearly separated subregions, which we then, and we then take the full data sample, interpolate it to the subregions, and then analyze that full data sample. So you can see here, there's a, this a purple thing up here, which is um, one of these mega regions, maybe. No, it's not 10, 10 is that one. It's, uh, it's not that one. It is maybe this one. Yes. So this is mega region two. And I said the way I find it, what's going on is to <coughs> is to deselect the cluster. That's a good, the best way of finding a cluster is to deselect it. But anyway, you can see there's a lot of structure here, a lot of clustering, and again, there's over a hundred real clusters in this data sample. Uh, there is a link in the resource page which will tell you where to find uh, further work on this on this thing. <coughs> All right, so that's the end of the examples, I believe. Let's go back to the PowerPoint and finish up. I've given you a lot of examples. Hopefully you learned a little bit about it. You just have to play around with PVIS. And you can get PlotVis by downloading loading it. And also there are lots of examples here, many of which I, I went through. And, um, and and you can also download it for both Macintosh and Windows. There is no Linux version at the moment. And um, we gradually, every now and then, improve it. And um, I wish you luck, it was used. I think it is very important to visualize what you do wherever you can. Sometimes you can't, and you just get numbers. But when you can get real. Pictures, it's pictures are worth a thousand words or something. So please use those pictures. And uh, there's some comment on the technology. The key graphics technology comes from something called uh, BTK, a very well-known open source visualization library, which is used in many more advanced visualization applications. They're much more advanced than PlotVis. The only feature PlotVis has is it's aimed at doing one thing and one thing only. Lots of points where those points have, have features which we found useful when looking at multidimensional scaling and other dimension reduction routines. QT and Boost are the other two major libraries we use. And that's the end of this uh, presentation on PluckViz. You're welcome to download it and have fun and use it both in this class, but and also with any anything else you need to do. Thank you very much.